moments in our life, I think, help us to see things a little bit more clearly. And especially when they're really um, significant moments. And one of those moments that I see in your story is in 2012, um, where I think you're 42 years old at the time, mm. and your manager and friend, Chris, dies. And I was lost for a minute because uh, I never really had to manage my career without a manager. And he wasn't just a manager, he was my brother. So it got scary for a minute. And I couldn't get it together, that's why I didn't put out no record for nine years. I just, I didn't feel comfortable putting out music until I got the right support system in place and I, I couldn't get it together. When you say you couldn't get it together, what, is that, what does that mean? That means like... Psychologically, you couldn't get it together. Psychologically, I couldn't get it together because I didn't feel like I had a support system that I could believe in enough to make me feel like I am psychologically able to move with the comfort, the confidence, and the support that I know I'm gonna need. And the responsibility of trying to wear all of the hats myself, I was doing it, but I wasn't doing it at the level that Chris Lighty was able to do it. And you were grieving at the same time. Absolutely, because I lost my father two years after Chris. The two most important male figures in my life. Chris was gone 2012, I lost my father 2014. And you had reconciled with him before? I definitely reconciled with him before he passed. The problem is I didn't get to enjoy my time with him once we got good. So that was a horrible feeling too. Because it's like all of the time that was wasted, fucking not getting along was, was stupid. Fucking stupid, you know what I'm saying? That's part of the reason why I started to really like get unhealthy and fucked up. I was trying everything to drown the pain and the frustration and the suffering of those losses by overworking, over drinking, over smoking weed and cigarettes. And it got so bad that I got to the weight of 340 pounds. I never been that, I, I'm, I'm not even built to be that heavy. It's, it's funny, it's like I look back at certain pictures and I looked at how overweight I was. I look at my skin. Yeah, there's certain pictures I had. I had these like marks on my face. I, I hate those pictures. Like I see the darkness in those pictures, y'all. There's this book called The Body Holds the School, but the title is just the thing that I, I, I've, I've actually gained the most from. It just says that when there's things going on in our psychology and our mind, the body will show it. Yeah, man. We'll eat, we'll drink, we'll, we won't sleep, but you'll see it in the body before you see it in the mind. The mind is invisible, obviously. Right. The, the body is the first place to see it. And I was reading through that phase of your life and you were on sort of breathing machines when you were sleeping and things like that. Nah, sleep, I wasn't on the apnea. breathing machine, I had sleep apnea. Oh, yeah, sleep apnea. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I had sleep apnea, I was- um, You drank yourself into a coma at one point? I drank myself into, not a coma, I drank myself into an inability to wake myself up. Oh, okay. I had to be wake, woken up by my son and my security in LA. It took like 45 minutes and we had just come back from hanging out at a club called Poppy's. He sat me down the next day, he was like, listen, I don't want to hurt your feelings because you're my father. And I don't even know if I got the strength to say it to you now, but I had a conversation with the security. I need you to listen to them because I'm too scared to tell you how I feel. That's how bad it was. My son ain't never speak to me like that in my life, but I needed to hear it but he couldn't even say it to me because that's how much he still was trying to protect my feelings. But this is the first time that I knew I really disappointed my son. 
all that Busta Rhymes shit was cool up until this moment when he saw this shit. And he's been seeing it, but this is when it hits the low. That conversation fucked me up. The next day, the doctor's with the prednisone, and I went to the doctor. I'm breathing so fucked up that outside of the door, the doctor was like, yo, why are you breathing like that? And he wasn't even in the room with me. He's coming in the room. And I said, breathing like what? Because I was doing it this so for so long over the last three years that I was it was starting to sound normal to me. The doctor said, I'm sending you to the hospital because he stuck this shit in my throat. And when he saw how big the fucking pallets was, it blocked 90% of my breathing passage. He said, if he sends me home and I take a shower and the central air system is blowing and I catch a draft that can lead to me catching a cold and that last 10% of my breathing gets blocked up because of a swollen gland from a sore throat or some shit, I can die in my sleep that night. He said, I've got to call an ambulance for you. I'm in California, L.A. He says, I need you to go right now to UCLA Medical Center into the emergency room, and I'm going to call the head person at the hospital to have them admit you immediately. You need to go into surgery tomorrow. I said, I ain't going in no ambulance. He said, well, then you have to sign this document that will exemplify me if you don't listen and something happens and you die bef bef between now and when you get to the hospital, I ain't never been spoken to like this in my life. This is when I knew this shit was crazy. My son now, I'm calling him, telling him to meet me at the hospital. We get to the hospital and I'm in the doctor's office and they doing all of the pre preliminary shit before they got to admit me into the emergency. My son is talking to me and he tells me, I thought you was going to die last night. And I ain't never been this scared, Dad. But I'm, I'm scared you're going to die. I lost Grandpa already. I can't lose you, too. Can you please stop drinking? Can you please stop smoking? Can you please get back to the daddy that I know you to be? Finished me. At that point, I made up my mind, I'm gonna get this surgery. When I get this surgery, I'm going to get in shape. I go home, on the way home, Dexter Jackson, bodybuilder competitor, used to compete in the Olympia. He became a Mr. Olympia champ. This man pops up in my stories, driving in his car in Jacksonville, Florida, and he's spitting the vocals to put your hands where my eyes can see. And then I hit him in the DM and I said, Mr. Jackson, I'm a huge fan of you as a professional bodybuilder. Is there any way that we could get on the phone? I need your help. He hits me back, he sends me his number. I call him on the phone. I said, thanks for calling me. I salute you, Mr. Jackson. Can we please figure out a way to get me back in shape. That man said to me, you saw you ready, bus? And I said, absolutely. He said, you gotta come to Jacksonville and you gotta stay here for 30 days. Tell your girl she can't come. Tell your kids you'll see them in 30 days. I need to put you through something for 30 days before we continue this journey. You survived this 30 days, I know you serious. I rented a motherfucking mansion for like seven bedrooms. I went and got a cameraman to document it. My meal prep chef, my masseuse, because I knew that that workout was going to fuck me up every day and I needed somebody to rub these muscles up. I got my recording engineer, so I didn't need to leave the house. I got an assistant. And that was about it. Stayed in the fucking crib for 30 days. Lost about 27 pounds in 30 days. These dudes that I'm surrounded by, by way of my first bodybuilding competitor trainer, Victor Munoz, and my second primary trainer, the legendary Mr. Olympia himself, Dexter Jackson, 
I was able to get my shit together, bro. And once I got my health and once I got my mind and I got my spirit right, and I started to be proud of me when I looked at me and my kids was looking at me and they would say shit that you could only hear once you did what you needed to do and put in the work you needed to put in so that it shows. They're not going to say it if it don't look like the way they need to see it so they could say what they need to say. When that happened, you hearing the right shit, you feeling the right love, that shit was lifting my spirit so much. And then I'm going to tell you something. Going through this pandemic was another serious challenge mentally and emotionally and spiritually. My brothers Pharrell Williams and Swiss Beats and Big Up to Timbaland too, because all four of them is the executive producers of this new album, Blockbuster. Which is out right now. Absolutely. The Blockbuster album is out and I'm super grateful to everybody that participated in helping this magic happen and come together. This is this is the culmination of all of the experience and all of the life stories that we've talked about. But the thing that really stood out to me is you've made the decision to put people on this album who are young, up and coming, fresher artists who you haven't really worked with previously. And you've worked with bloody everybody, everybody, but you chose to give these younger artists the platform for some reason. Two reasons. The first reason is, I'm never going to listen to the narrative of this thing where I would hear it a little more regularly than I actually choose to hear it. I actually don't ever want to hear it. But it's this bullshit about how the elder statesmen or the older MCs don't really respect what the new guys is doing. That shit is bullshit. At least... Speaking for myself and the, the type of artists that I surround myself with, we don't feel like that. and We don't move like that. We encourage that shit because when we was young artists, we wanted the big dudes to put their arms around us and give us game and school us and teach us shit so we could be better. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Chuck D gave me my name. Big Daddy Kane used to let me come to his crib and ask questions. He put me on his albums. He used to help me learn, let me learn. Bring me the shows that he was performing at. Fucking um, De La Soul, they did the same shit for us. Like, too many MCs gave us the guidance that made me great. I feel like it's only right that we do the same shit for the next generation of motherfuckers, especially if they dope. And I'm a fan of a lot of these new artists. And I want to work with them because they still inspire me to want to go in the studio and stay razor blade sharp with my shit when I got to do my shit. You know what I'm saying? And I see a lot of them paying homage. There's a lot of motherfuckers walking around with their hairstyles like how I used to wear it with my dress. There's a lot of motherfuckers that dress and they throw their heavy jewelry on that do it the way I used to do it and still do it. I just ain't got the dreads no more, but all that other shit, we still doing it. But I just want to make sure that they, they know we're not only here to give them the answers and the mentorship and the guidance and the information so they could be that much more sharper when they're being creative or when they're sitting in the fucking corporate office negotiating a deal with their lawyers and their managers. But I also want them to know that we love them too. We're fans of what they're doing. We see y'all paying homage and we want y'all to know we paying homage to y'all too. One of the things I always think is destined to own the future is when the when both the past and present come together. And I say that with all due respect, because sometimes people see projects like this as you passing the torch, but what you're actually doing is sharing the flame. Sharing the fucking flame. You couldn't have said it better. Cause I ain't, I ain't putting the flame out no time soon. Well, you're, th you're 33 years deep and it's still, you're still <laughs> selling out the shows and doing the arenas and killing the game. And I, I'm, I'm so excited by this project because for those reasons, because you have, you have two, sort of generations coming together to create the future. Yeah. And that's what's so exciting. And I have to say from this conversation, everything you say and understanding the man that Buster is puts so much more meaning into the lyrics, into the album and the record. So Thank you. everyone needs to go check this album out Thank right you. now, wherever you stream anything, please go check it out. Cause it's one hell of a project. And you're, you, you know, you talked about that Google CEO who 
you inspired when he was 10 years old. You were that person and you still are that person for me. Thank you, King. So, so it's such an honor to have to, to get to spend this time with you today. Thank you, um, man. And Likewise, to, man, for you know, real. I Beautiful. really, really appreciate it.